Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Whiteboard Finance Show. Today's guest is Alfonso Picatiello, a.k.a. Macro Alf. He is the author of The Macro Compass, a free newsletter delivering financial education, macro insights, and investment ideas. Um, I found him through Twitter. He has about 105,000 followers on there, and he was also the former head of a $20 billion investment portfolio. Uh, let me pull up Google Translate here. Buongiorno, Signor Alf. Benvenuto, uh, Whiteboard Finance Show. Como stai? Grazie Marco, tutto bene. Eh, bene Hi guys, bene. <laughs> uh, this is Alf speaking, pleasure to be here. We'll do this in English, don't worry. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, I found you on Twitter, you have a lot of really nice insights and it seems like you've been, um, you're, you're more insightful, I don't want to say more insightful, but your insights on the bond market are very, very good. So just tell us a little bit about your background and then also why understanding the bond market is so important. Yeah, so uh, basically until a few months ago, I uh, traded a $20 billion book for a uh, publicly traded bank in Europe, a large one. And I've been doing that for seven years. Um, I decided to stop doing that and um, move to the content producing side of the equation, basically, and publish my newsletter called The Macro Compass now, where I can share my knowledge and my learning journey with you guys. And my home turf, as Marco, you said correctly, that's the bond market. Uh, most of this $20 billion portfolio was in bonds. Um, so a bit of credit, but also, you know, mostly bonds, um, but also equities, some of it. Bonds is really my home turf. And um, also because I have to say from the very beginning, so when I was probably 14 or 15, I already got introduced to this market by uh, none less than my mother. She's the treasurer in a, in a small uh, Italian bank. I'm Italian. Well, I guess my accent gave that up already. Um, and so, you know, since high school already, I was introduced to the topic because she was very passionate about it, had to trade a lot of bonds for, for the small Italian banks. So I got very interested in the topic in finance in general, ended up at university, worked my way up in a bank uh, till managing this large portfolio. And now I'm not sure if the shit shift is up, down or lateral, but I don't care because at the end of the day, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now, which is to, to basically put out the, the knowledge I've accumulated and uh, go through this learning journey that never stops with you guys through the Macro Compass. Beautiful. I love it. That's similar to my journey. I worked in traditional finance, finished with a finance degree, um, started making YouTube videos, and now it's a full-time uh, job, believe it or not. So it's very rewarding, though. I love it because uh, I can have conversations with people like you. Um, so I did a video about um, the bond market collapsing. It was very sensational, obviously a little bit clickbait. It's obviously not collapsing. But um, I liked your quote talking about not understanding bonds is kind of like eating soup with a fork. Uh, so yes. can you elaborate on that? I mean... Investors across the world allocate capital. And so when they make decisions, Marco, they are like, okay, so I have some savings, most likely in a bank account, in a bank deposit format. How am I going to protect my purchasing power going forward? Or at least I hope that's the consideration because we have lived through the YOLO, cold buying uh, <laughs> frenzy where you know it's not about protecting my purchasing power, but it's about, about becoming rich as, as soon as I can. Going to the well, moon. Going yeah, to the, moon. to the moon, to the moon, <laughs> YOLO to the moon. Now back to reality, all these YOLO calls are not working as well anymore. So I hope people go back to the good old, how am I going to protect my purchasing power, right? So they look at different asset classes and um, people tend to uh, sort of see those asset classes as separate. But in reality, if you have been into the, the system and managing large sums of money, you realize that they are very much interconnected and actually, there's a sort of a pyramid, basically, between us classes and capital allocation decisions. And the bond market stands at the very bottom of this uh, pyramid, basically. So it's extremely important for people to understand its mechanism and why uh, it is so relevant for other asset classes. And so we are seeing now that as, as the Federal Reserve or other central banks start to change their stance when it comes to monetary policy. And also they tell you their incentive scheme has changed compared to what it was in 2020 or 2021. Then you start seeing as well other asset classes, not only the bond market, but other asset classes reacting accordingly. So I always say, you know, if, if you invest your money in different asset classes and you don't follow or make good effort to understand what's going on in the bond market, you're eating soup with a fork. You can still do it, but it's, it's you know, it's much more cumbersome. Understood. So if you had to define the, those layers of the pyramid, if bonds are on the bottom, what are the next steps up? So 
it's bonds at the bottom and then it's credit in the middle and then it's equities at the top and all other more risky assets at the top of it. And why do I say that is, is really is really simple. So but the bond market stands at the bottom of this pyramid because our monetary system is basically based on newly created credit. So what we say is, all right, Marco, we have, you know, we, we want to grow. We want GDP to grow year after year. And how do we do that is we use the resources that uh, we structurally have in our economy. And that's the amount of people that work, contribute actively to economic growth and how productive are these guys? How productive is the capital we put through, through the economy? How productive is labor? Those are really the two key structural forces to grow. Mm -hmm. And so when you realize around the 80s, the 90s, the politicians realized that, you know, this demographic boom we had sec post the Second World War actually started stopping as in the boom was there. And then in the 70s and in the 80s, you had this labor force expansion, you know, all these boomers, baby boomers getting into the labor force. Mm -hmm. It means more people contributing to the economic growth. It means better, more organic growth. You also had a productivity development from the 50s to the 80s. You had an industrial development and you had this post-World War, you know, uh, rosy environment for population growth and for productivity. Reach the 80s, the late 80s. Well, where is the tailwind anymore? It's not really there anymore. It's still somehow there, but it's declining in the rate of growth. And so, so we, start, we start levering up. From the 80s to 2020, what we have really done is instead of slowing down our structural rate of growth, we wanted to maintain it in the 3%, 4% camp year after year, despite you know, the structural tailwinds were fading away. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Yeah, we, we, we borrow, we lever up. We basically say, you know, if I want to buy a house and I want it to cost, you know, I want it to be 500K this year and then 600K next year and then 700K next year, I will need people to be able to, to buy that at that increased price. How do I do that? I make them borrow at a cheaper and cheaper borrowing cost. That's a basically what... AKA low interest rates. Correct. Got it. So uh, low inflation adjusted interest rate, real borrowing costs after inflation have gone down materially from the 80s to 2020. And so we continue to do this trick where we bring more credit into the economy and we make it much cheaper for people to borrow so that they are incentivized or they feel they can borrow more, which means they can purchase uh, you know, highly priced assets. And also the economy tends to run because we oil it with all this credit and all this purchasing power that in reality is just future purchasing power that we are bringing forward while borrowing at very cheap rates today. Mm -hmm. And so the bond market, coming back to your question, sorry for the long answer, stands at the, at the bottom of this pyramid because bond market prices and bond market yields are the very first layer that determines if you can get this credit cheap or expensive. Your mortgage rate depends on where bond yields are. How banks think of making mortgage rates is they look at where treasury yields are, mm -hmm. and then they, of course, overlay a credit spread on it because you know, you're not the treasury, you're not the government, you're Marco and you're Alf, so you can lose your job. And then at some point, you might be able not to pay anymore your mortgage. So the bank needs to apply credit spread on top. So if you look at the pyramid, it's bond and then it's credit, and then it's equities, and then it's everything else on top. But understanding how the bottom of the pyramid works and why bond yields move up or down and whether the curve is steep or flat, those are very important things to understand how to allocate your capital throughout the structure. Absolutely. Yeah. So for people that are at least in the United States, typically our 30-year fixed mortgage rates, they follow the 10-year treasury curve. Um, I pulled up something on my video a couple weeks ago. Uh, it basically just showed how it was completely almost like a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, it, it, the, the mortgage rates lagged uh, the 10-year treasury by maybe you know a few days or weeks, if you will. Um, so now knowing all this, um, what is kind of like your macro theme? I know you have a couple different ways to determine this. I know you have your macro compass. Uh, can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Like, what are your what are your conviction trades now? Knowing all this, so let's make it simple, and then we go into the details. The the main macro thesis is that um, this is the moment to play defense with your portfolio and not to play offense. You have probably played offense. I hope so in a very successful way throughout the second half of 2020 and throughout the whole 2021. Well, this is not the period to be very aggressive. It's the period to be more defensive about your purchasing power, which generally means increasing your cash allocation, which, you know, it, it's something very expensive to do over a very long period of time, but over medium or short periods of time can 
provide you with uh, some liquidity to, to put at work at better entry levels. And also, if you're not in the US, I generally like increasing my dollar exposure here. So you can either get access to a dollar bank account or to short-term dollar instruments that basically give you access to dollar exposure. And if you really have to be invested because you have a mandate or because you, know, you, you really don't want to get um, super defensive, then I would generally advise to look for more defensive sectors. So what I call the low beta sectors, basically where uh, they, they track the indices, but they track it to a lower extent than highly volatile companies and especially uh, sectors that are uh, strong balance sheet sectors. So I'm talking about um, pharma, utilities, this kind of more defensive stock market sectors. Consumer rather, staples, things like that. Sorry consumer staples, yeah. correct, Got exactly it. those rather than going and look for, um, yeah, whatever, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the uh, highly, highly um, speculative, uh, no cash flow generating, weak balance sheet, high leveraged companies. Those worked very well throughout the second half of 2020 and the first half of 2021. But the macro environment is materially different today than it was back then. Absolutely. So let me elaborate on what I mean shortly. So we talked about this credit creation, right? So the, the basically the private sector, if you if you flood credit through the private sector, the private sector at some point is able to, you know, to spend it, to, to put it at work in the real economy, and then earnings go up, GDP goes up, and then you know, ultimately these animal spirits get reflected as well into asset class performance. So the risky asset class do well when credit is being uh, dumped into the private sector at cheap rates and in, in huge quantities. And that's what happened between 2020 and 2021. Now, the problem is that this situation often reverses because there are periods where credit doesn't get thrown to the private sector very aggressively. And that's basically second half of 2021 and 2022. And why that is happening is because who actually gives resources to spend to the private sector is not central banks, and we can talk about that, mm -hmm. but it's the government and commercial banks. So the government basically can send you checks. The government has the ability to issue currency whenever they want. They are the monopolist of the domestic currency that we use. Mm -hmm. So if the US government says, I would like Marco to receive a check, they just literally make a hole in their balance sheet and they transfer resources to the private sector. And they say, Marco, here is your check. We're going to take care of fund it via bonds. There are mechanisms we can talk about before, but don't lose sight of the important thing. The private sector can get a boost from the government deciding that they want new resources being allocated to Marco and Alf. They want to send you checks. They want to cut your taxes. You know, they want to have more resources, for you to have more resources available. Mm -hmm. And so that happened a lot in 2020, 2021. If you remember the reaction from the US government in terms of fiscal deficits was massive, but that's not the case in the second half of 2021 and not in 2022. So the, the impulse of these fiscal transfers has basically diminished dramatically. And the same goes for banks, Marco. They lent a lot of money in 2020 and 2021 to the private sectors uh, because basically the government was saying, you know, if you default, then if, if the private sector defaults, the government is going to guarantee the losses. But that's not the case anymore. The government isn't guaranteeing any losses. And so banks are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So a lot of these guys have, you know, real wages lower than before the pandemic. So after inflation, their salary isn't going up really. After inflation, the salary has probably gone down. So they have a, a less real wages than before. They're probably, they have more debt than they had before. I'm not sure I really want to lend to these guys anymore if the government isn't guaranteeing my losses. Mm -hmm. And so banks are also withdrawing some of their, of their credit extension, right? And so where is this credit flawed? You have the opposite now. You have a credit drought, actually. So you have this uh, slowdown in the credit impulse. When that happens, as earnings go up, when credit impulse goes up, earnings tend to go down when the amount of credit that you throw to the private sector goes down because economic activity obviously tends to slow if the private sector has to revert back to its mean, to its, you know, to its structural trends, not its boosted cyclical trends. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, and on top of it, the Federal Reserve is telling you, oh, we have an inflation problem. Um, and uh, there is this supply side thingy that I can't really do much about. Uh, I can still do something about demand, though. So I can make sure that Marco and Alpha are less buoyant, less animal spirits. Um, they have higher borrowing costs. So they think twice when they have to go and buy a very expensive house or 
you know, do investment decisions, they tend to be more conservative. I can slow down demand. Mm -hmm. And they have been telling you that they do really want you to slow down. So at the same time, you have a a Federal Reserve tightening into a slowdown, which is already caused and enhanced by a lower credit impulse. They're also tightening conditions on top. And this is not the environment where you want to be offensive. This is the environment where you want to be defensive. Understood. So in terms of the uh, the hot topic now, and thank you for that, by the way, everyone's talking about the yield curve. You know, this typically yeah. indicates, you know, future recessions or periods of recession. Um, what are your thoughts on this now? Because it is kind of the hot topic right now. Yeah. So uh, the, the R word uh, recession is always <laughs> thrown away. Um, and the my point is, look, if it's a sharp economic slowdown or a recession, for markets and for your investment decision, it doesn't really change much. What I'm saying is that the, the definition of a recession is two quarters in a row of negative quarter on quarter growth, mm-hmm. according to the NBER. If instead of two quarters in a row of negative growth, you get two quarters in a row of 0% growth, for markets, it's not going to change much. It still sucks. It means you're in a slowdown, right? Mm-hmm. So what I'm seeing here is that the bond market is pretty loud in in saying that uh, the Federal Reserve is going to tighten. So if you look at what the bond market is pricing in the front end, the next two years, basically, um, I see bond markets pricing a Fed funds terminal rate at about 3%. 3%, And what that means is that what that means is that they're 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 saying they're convinced that the Federal Reserve will do a very fast hiking cycle where in 2022, they're going to bring federal funds rate at 2.5% in a single year from 0 to 2.5%, Marco. Wow. That's the fast, if realized, that's the fastest ever hiking cycle since 1994. So it's a very aggressive one. And then between December 2022 and December 2023, the market expects another 50 basis point to bring us to the terminal Fed funds rate of 3%. That's where the hiking cycle stops. But do you know what the bond market is pricing for 2024? No. They're pricing interest rate cuts already. So what that means is that the bond market is basically saying, wow, I I listen to you, Fed. I see you're motivated. I know you have an inflation problem and you are going to act on it. I I see that. I want to price you in. Mm -hmm. What they also see is that if the Federal Reserve is going to hike that fast in an economy which is very indebted, very leveraged up, as we discussed before. Mm-hmm. And also it's slowing down from a cyclical perspective after the rush we had in 2020, in the second half of 2020 and 2021. They're going to probably complicate the slowdown further. They're going to enhance it. When they enhance it, there is a chance that the economy slows down that much that the Federal Reserve has to backtrack on their policies and in 2024 start cutting rates already. Mm-hmm. This is also visible if you look at long-term yields, like 30-year treasury yields against five-year treasury yields. Our people are saying curve inverted. Yeah, of course, because the five-year treasury yields have to reflect the Federal, the Federal Reserve hiking cycle over the short term, right? The next three to five years, those are reflected in three to five-year yields. 30-year yields, though, they reflect something else. They reflect nominal growth, which is real growth and inflation expectations over the next 30 years. If you own bonds for 30 years, you're basically looking at real growth and inflation expectation over the very long term. And so the driver for 30 year yields is very different than the driver for two or five year yields, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the same good old metrics we were talking about before, labor force growth, productivity, and trend inflation. And, you know, we are not making child. We are having birth rates, which are extremely low. If I look at population growth, wow, that's poor. Like the US is one of the best position between brackets, jurisdictions between developed markets. And I look at the labor supply growth. So how many people are going to enter the workforce on aggregate every year? And over the next 30 years, the United Nations estimates that the labor force in America is going to grow by 0%, which means in 30 years from now, the US is going to have the same workers than it had than it does today. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you don't grow your labor force, you're not growing your pie, the pie remains the same. And so the only thing that can make this pie grow is the productivity of this labor force. But you will understand that the the growth you'll be able to generate only from productivity, is not that high. And on top of it, you have 
technology, technological advancements, you have high debt levels, uh, aging demographics, and all these things we're talking about. And this is what the long end of the bond market cares about because it's 30-year yields. It's not three-year yields. It's mm-hmm. yields over the next 30 years. And so those remain very anchored around these structural levels and structural headwinds we're talking about, while the short end can move up temporarily if the Federal Reserve goes with the hiking cycle. And then obviously, if the short end goes up in terms of yields and the long end remain anchored around this, um, these metrics we discussed, yield curves tend to invert. And I think the bond market is doing a very good job at speaking very loud about these this problems. And as always, you will have at the beginning, the Federal Reserve we will try their best to well, overlook or find a creative ways to say that the yield curve doesn't matter. But in reality, it's not like people tend to say the yield curve precedes recessions. Again, the yield curve is flattening for good reasons. And if it's not a recession, it's likely to be a sharp economic slowdown. And the Federal Reserve, as always, has an incentive scheme, which they want to go for, which is to fight inflation. And they're going to try to buy time and say that the yield curve inversion doesn't matter, that certain very creative slopes of the yield curve are not inverted, so it's all fine. But in reality, I think the message is pretty clear. Understood. In, in economics, there's a phrase, I actually tweeted this before you jumped on the call, is demographics equals destiny. So if Correct. you're if you're like a Japan, for example, and you have an aging population, what happens to countries like that if they can't exponentially increase their productivity, as you mentioned? Well, you end up in a situation where your um, structural GDP growth year after year is really, really low. So Japan has a workforce that shrinks year after year, and it, it is slightly offset well, more than slightly offset by productivity rates, which puts Japanese potential GDP growth at around about half a percent a year, maybe 1% a year. That's it, half a percent. Mm -hmm. Now you you basically grow very, very, very little. If you want to grow more, what you do, Mark, as we discussed before, you lever up, right? You you say, okay, I'm going to borrow and I'm going to throw more resources at the private sector. It's a shrinking labor force with a stable productivity then now all of a sudden gets thrown more resources at it. That's basically what it is. Now, the issue is obviously if wages aren't going up, in order for this additional leverage to be thrown at the Japanese workforce, it needs to be very cheap, Mm -hmm. very, very cheap. So then real interest rates are going to be very low. And that's basically the kick the can down the road mechanism you're going to be trying and, and, and achieve, right? They've been doing this since the 90s, I feel like. And I feel like United States is almost like uh, it lags Europe and Japan by maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 years, whether it's politically, culturally, you know, philosophically. And I feel like what we're seeing in Europe, because you and I obviously both have ties to Europe. Whenever I go to Europe, I see the things happening in the United States 10 years later, 20 years later. And it's like, I already saw this before, right? Like, am I, am I right with that or accurate? You're right. You are right. And there are, of course, differences amongst jurisdictions. But I put a chart on the macro compass that shows that Europe lags Japan by 10 years and the US lags Europe by 10 years, eight okay. years on average. So basically, US is Japan 18 to 20 year <laughs> lag, yeah. effectively. And it's very hard for people to believe that. And again, the US is very different from Japan from a couple of perspectives. First of all, nowadays, the US has the global reserve currency that allows them uh, more flexibility, let's say, than, than Japan has under certain circumstances. It also attracts capital to the US. And that's also why the US can have Silicon Valley, very productive, um, you know, uh, very productive uh, technological sector as well. And that helps on the margin. And also why US can attract more immigration mm-hmm. because net the net um, labor supply growth is also influenced by immigration. If I have net immigrants that join the labor force every year, that's good for my economy, right? In terms of long-term structural growth. So the US is different from Japan from this perspective, but the direction of travel is inevitable because US potential GDP growth calculated today is about 1.6%. And so 1.6% is not an extremely palatable GDP growth for any politician. I mean, everybody wants to grow 3 to 4%. So the US has been doing the same. They've been sloshing the private sector with more credit. They've been levering it up, either the public sector or the private sector, a combination of both. U.S. private and public debt to GDP is 320% combined. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, you, you wonder up until which point I can raise this number. And here I want to make sure that people understand the public sector and the private sector are very different animals. The public sector, if it issues in its own currency and inflation doesn't go completely out of control, in principle, can have very large amounts of debt without much problem. And why is that? Because the public sector, the government, is the issuer of the currency. It's the monopolist of the currency. So as long as people trust that currency, they can just say, look, I'm going to, you know, if I have a debt to, or, or an obligation to fill, how am I going to fill that? I'm going to issue more debt because I am the issuer of this currency. Mm-hmm. If it's in domestic currency and there are no out of, inf- uh, you know, inflation is not out of control. The private sector, on the other hand, is a different problem. If I have a problem paying my mortgage, Marco, I can't go to the bank and I say, I'm going to print some ALF coins and I'm <laughs> going to pay you with that. That doesn't work. So I, I need to have more earnings capacity, more cash flow generating capacity, right? I need to imp- increase my productivity levels. Mm-hmm. And so the private sector can be levered up only until a certain point. Coming back to your Japan point, the government in Japan has always been very um, generous with fiscal deficits. They've been doing deficits for well, 25 years in a row, right? But why is Japan not able to grow cyclically that much stronger than the half or percent or 1% structural GDP growth we talked about before? It's because the private sector is saying, I'm sorry, dude, I can't take more leverage. I mean, you want to cut my taxes, you want to throw more credit at me? Sure, but I don't feel comfortable with all this credit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the newly created credit you just sent me, and I'm going to pay back some debt that I had in the past, which basically offsets effectively the, the whole effect because the private sector in Japan knows they can't grow. They're aging. Their productivity levels are stagnating. They don't have net immigration. And so they've been actively fighting back this leveraging mechanism also because interest rates in Japan are already at 0%. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to make it cheaper for me, Marco, to bring my leverage from four times to five times with the same salary, with the same long-term productivity trends that I have in my mind? How are you going to make it for me affordable to borrow if rates are already at 0%? And in the US, rates are not 0%, but we got very close to that in 2020. And so at the next round, if the US wants to lever up its private sector even more than it is today, yeah, I'm sorry, but it has to make it even cheaper. Or otherwise, you'll have to find a way to tell me how the US structural growth, so population growth, productivity levels can grow very substantially so that people make higher salaries and they can therefore lever up even if rates are not zero. And so you you see where I'm going here. We're all in the same camp. I think, because that's how our monetary system works. It works like this in Japan, in China, in Europe, in the US. On the macro compass, I posted a chart on private plus public debt levels in China, Japan, Europe, and the US. And of course, the time, uh, there there are some time lags, but we're all playing the same game, Mm -hmm. China included. China had a massive labor supply growth, huge uh, between the 80s and uh, 2000, so basically 20 years later than the US had, mm-hmm. they entered WTO in 2000. They had a huge productivity boost between 2000 and 2010, right? Because they started trading, they uh, they they you know they put down barriers also for internal immigration. New companies were set up, big productivity boost, and then goes 2010, and all this productivity boost and this labor supply growth boost is over. Mm-hmm. And so, what did China do? They levered up the economy at an incredible pace. They levered up households, corporates, anything they could lever up to the point that if I look at China public plus private debt today, it's at the same level of the US. China levered up their economy from 200 to 300% of GDP in 10 years. The US took 30 years to achieve such a leverage and Europe as well took 25 years. China only accelerated the trend and Japan took even longer to get there but we're all playing the same game at different time lags. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with that because when you look at any chart of uh, balance sheets of any central bank, you know, they literally almost look all the same. They're obviously going up and to the right. Um, The one thing I want to talk about where you said, I can't print, you know, ALF coin or, you know, (laughs) some random coin and pay off my mortgage with that. Basically what you're describing, what I'm hearing is uh, essentially modern monetary theory. Um, so if you're familiar with that, if you want to maybe explain that to the audience, if you feel, if you feel comfortable, and then also 
you know, anyone with common sense knows that modern monetary theory, the game of musical chairs has to stop at some point. You can't just print money. You can't print your problems away with money. Um, I guess with modern monetary theory, people say, hey, you know, our balance sheet, our household's balance sheet is not the same as the government's balance sheet, similar to what you just described. Um, So at what point, you know, does that make sense or not make sense? I'm not sure what your take is on this. I'm just curious. Yeah. Open question. We didn't prepare that before the podcast. So, uh, <laughs> None of this was prepared, by the way. <laughs> my, my take on that is that MMT is a, is a theory, is an economic theory that has some pretty good grounds and some pretty bad takes. So the pretty good ground is that it uh, dispels the deficit myth. Mm -hmm. So Stephanie Kelton, I think, wrote a book called The Deficit Myth, which I read. And I think it's it's brilliant under certain circumstances, and there are some bad takes in that. So let me specify. So uh, we are taught at university to think that the government uh, has the same limitations the households have, and that's just not right. The government balance sheet doesn't work like a household balance sheet. The government issues the currency. We use the currency as private sector. That's that's a material different. And MMT has been very vocal about that. And I think they're right. They're right. Just just running a T accounting system of how, who and how money is created gets you a better understanding uh, compared to the you know Keynesian theories we are taught at university, mm-hmm. which are mostly wrong when it comes to money. <laughs> and money creation. Uh, It's actually true. But where do they take it wrong is that they basically assume, they bring this this concept of household's balance sheet working different than government balance sheet to the extreme. And they say, well, unemployment shouldn't exist. That's basically one theory of MMT where they say, the government is the issuer of the currency and it can just top up and down the amount of money, credit, however you want to call it, that goes to the private sector at any point in time, it can make it run very fast. And then when things are running very fast, it can just withdraw these resources or can increase taxes, which is the same, because it will ask the private sector to basically pay back some of this newly created money. And that is going to be a mechanism that works perfectly by itself. We don't need anything else. Unemployment shouldn't exist. We are choosing to have luck in the economy. That's basically what they say. By being too stingy, and thinking of deficits like they are evil. So deficits are not evil in the first place. They are evil if the credit which is created, the new money that is, cre- that is created, is spent in unproductive ways. So if we lever up and uh, you know, we go buy houses or we, you know, we, we go and buy yellow coals with it, then luckily, likely this is not the right, right use of credit. But What the MMT doesn't look at is the fact that the private sector uh, will make a certain use again of this newly created credit. It's not like there is an optimal credit allocator that says, oh, I'm the private sector, Uh, MMT is the prevailing uh, uh, theory. They're now throwing credit at us. I will make my rational assessment on how to use credit that is credit to me so that the economy grows and that we close the gap and we, we all invest in productive outlets, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, the private sector doesn't do that. The private sector allocates resources to whatever they deem fit at any point in time, which is basically, it, it causes, um, if applied to the maximum, this theory effectively causes large imbalances very frequently. 2021 in the US is a roughly a decent example. So that's, People say 2021 in the US is MMT. No, it's not because MMT brought to the maximum extent means that politicians today wouldn't be discussing about how do I slow down this? How do I, how do I pay back my debt? Mm-hmm. They would simply be, be saying, okay, say, forget it. I don't, I, I don't have any debt to pay back. Exactly. That doesn't matter. What I have to do here is to make sure I slow down the private sector by signaling or taking resources back from them, but not with the mentality of paying back debt. So MMT is, 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 we have a half MMT here when it comes to spending, but then the other half of MMT, we don't have it yet because people are still thinking about how to pay back debt, right? But the first half of the MMT-like experiment we had in America in 2021 I think it's a pretty interesting one because 
what America did is they went away and spent 20 to 25% of GDP in fiscal deficits in a year and a half. Mm-hmm. That's huge. It's, it's a huge amount of new resources thrown to the private sector. And true, some of these resources had to offset the pandemic losses. They were very large, right? But now you realize those resources were way too much. I mean, the US overreacted when it comes to fiscal stimulus. They did way too much on an aggregate level. And now we are seeing the private sector using these resources in a, in an, you know, they, they probably use most of these resources in a, in a, in a non long term productive way. So they filled their income gap and then they went on and they, with animal spirits, they perhaps made some investments without thinking about the long term productivity of these investments. Mm-hmm. And now, coupling up this with supply constrictions, you have inflation running at seven and a half percent. And now, you know, the MMT theory would say, okay, well, first of all, that shouldn't happen because if you throw resources at the private sector in a commensurate amount, which is very difficult to estimate ex ante, I should add, you wouldn't have inflation at 7.5%, but you would have, you know, a more balanced recovery. But now that we are here, we don't care about paying back our debt. We just care about slowing down the whole, the whole thing, which is not what politicians are thinking. They're thinking about how do I ever pay back my 140% federal debt to GDP? So we have a half a half MMT, and I think there are good takes and bad takes in the theory. Understood. So I think this all ties into, and I know you have to run here in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I, there's so much more I, want, I prepared for this interview, but I know we're kind of constrained. But I think the big elephant in the room, especially now, are central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Yeah. So I feel, I've been following this stuff, I told you before we got on the call, I'm 34, I've been following this stuff for like 20 years, and I've always been kind of like on the not the mainstream media sort of uh, perspective, but I've always followed kind of like fringe documentaries and things like that. So I've always known about uh, fractional reserve banking, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, central banks, things like this, right? Um, So now what I'm seeing uh, in my young age, I guess, I'm still young, relatively speaking, I feel like politicians are starting to see that, hey, you know, people are awakening to this, you know, fiat credit system because everything is credit, as you mentioned in the beginning of this podcast. Do you think that CBDCs are kind of like the emergency break or like the parachute or like the emergency button yeah. for all of this? So extremely smart question, Marco. And CBDC are an escape route um, to kick the can down the road further. So let me try and, 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 and um, explain what I mean. Go back to the Japanese example or the European example. So in Europe, we have... Um, ECB, European Central Bank, deposit rates at minus 0.5%, mm-hmm. minus 0.5%. So hold on real quick, real quick. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Alf. I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to derail you. So for American people, they can't even fathom this. So can you just briefly explain that very quickly? It means that if you are a commercial bank in Europe and has access to the European Central Bank deposit rate and you want to deposit money overnight at the European Central Bank, you will be paying 0.5% to the European Central Bank for the luxury to deposit your money overnight at the European Central Bank. He's saying to deposit money at the bank, you will have to pay for that instead of receiving interest, which most people are used to. You know, now it's the other way around. Sorry. uh, So continue. I I apologize. I didn't mean to derail your thought. No, that's cool. Uh, I know it's very weird, but that's uh, (laughs) what we do in Europe. By the way, in Denmark, in Switzerland, so also in other places that don't have the euro, but are trading, uh, entering partners of the eurozone, we have ended up in a similar situation, Sweden, Denmark, um, Switzerland. Mm-hmm. So go back to this. And now think about what we just discussed. We said that um, demographics and productivity are very poor. And so poor structural GDP growth is waiting for us. And we instead want to grow more. We want to you know, achieve decent levels of growth. So we need credit to achieve that. That's what we we have discussed. And um, say that to make credit cheaper for a European guy, you need to have rates that are lower, right? I mean, if you want somebody to lever up more than it is already uh, and his wage is not higher, then credit needs to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. How are you going to make credit cheaper on a marginal basis if interest rates are already minus 0.5%? There are two ways. Either inflation goes up uh, by a decent amount in a sustainable way, by the way, which basically means that the nominal interest rate that you will be paying is still around about zero, 
but inflation will eat away the liability, the, the debt on a real basis. So basically, if you borrow a million and inflation is running at 3% for 10 years, when you go and you pay back, you have to pay back the same million that is worth much less in real terms because inflation has gone up. That's the other way to make borrowing more affordable, mm -hmm. let's say. Now, uh, the other way to make it more affordable, and I think the, the central banks are going towards that direction, is to make sure that interest rates are not floored at minus 0.5 or minus 0.75%. Today, the reason why they are floored is the existence of physical cash. So the existence of physical cash basically implies that somebody in Switzerland or in Europe, if you want to make him pay 1% to own money on a bank account, he would rather start looking at some vaults. And vaults obviously have an insurance cost, have a storage cost, have a transportation cost when you need the money. Mm -hmm. It's very impractical. But if you try hard, you're, you can convince few people to start looking at physical ownership of cash rather than uh, the digital ownership of cash, which is 97% of cash existing in today's monetary system is in digital format, in digital bank deposits. Yeah, can you, now, please, can you please repeat that? Because I don't think most people understand that. They truly don't. 97% yeah. of existing cash-like instruments in our economy are digital forms of cash known as bank deposits, which nowadays are mostly digital bank deposits. Ones and zeros. We exchange when we transact, right? Against each other, we mostly send each other bank deposits one way or another. Mm -hmm. Cash only represents in physical format around 2 to 3% of today's um, existing cash. If you penalize bank deposits to the point you have to pay 1% or more, to own a bank deposit, then few people might think, oh, you can't charge me to own cash. So I'm going to transform these bank deposits from digital format into physical format, into cash. And central banks don't necessarily like that because that, that, that is contrary to, the, to what they want to achieve. They want to achieve borrowing rates being so low that you're not going to hoard resources. You're going to be willing to get more resources, spend them, right? Keep the and circulation so CBDC, going. To, to make it circulate. And then CBDC come into the equation because if you make um, cash completely digital and then you say, okay, guys, now instead of having a bank account at a commercial bank in Europe, you can have it at the European Central Bank straight away. So you don't run basically any credit risk anymore because the, the central bank is an arm of the government at the end of the day. It exists as the monetary arm of the government. Mm -hmm. And so basically in your own domestic currency, you don't run any risk because we are the issuer of the currency in the first place. You can have a bank account at the European Central Bank straight away. And via CBDC, basically this will be the, the currency you will be using um, in the future. If this project really unfolds to the maximum extent, then it's the European Central Bank itself that can say, Marco, interest rates for you are negative 3% now because we have made some, some study and we think the cohort of people where you belong can spend more, can borrow more. So we want to incentivize you and you're going to be paying 3% on this, on this bank deposit. Mm -hmm. So effectively, CBDC allows them to remove the constraints from physical cash ownership once they make basically cash completely digital, all in digital format. And ultimately, they can push the boundaries of negative interest rates to even lower levels because the physical cash constraint doesn't exist anymore to encourage people to lever up more and borrow at cheaper levels, right? To make the, the economy run cyclically stronger than it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, they can target monetary policy much better than they can now. Because one that now they have one rate that applies to everybody. And in this way, being all digital and very applicable, they could reach different cohort of people and apply theoretically different tiers of monetary policy uh, uh, you know, around the private sector. Absolutely. They can almost filter it by, you know, demographic, sex, you know, yes. whatever. It's it's kind of like this mixing board. I can turn your volume up and down. I can turn my volume up and down. It doesn't have to be the volume of the entire podcast. Correct. Okay, so I know you have to run. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you, and then we can uh, end the podcast, and I appreciate your time very much. How does Bitcoin tie into all this? I don't know if you're a Bitcoiner or crypto, whatever you want to call it. Me, I'm personally a Bitcoiner because I believe in sound money, more of like the Austrian school of economics. But, um, you know, whatever you want to talk about, crypto, Bitcoin, whatever. So uh, 
the discussion around Bitcoin is very polarized. Um, there are, you know, uh, Bitcoin standards and uh, Bitcoin standard people and Bitcoin denier, it's worth zero. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a very stupid approach. If I have to say, there is a much more nuanced approach to this, which is smart investor thinks in probabilities, Marco. So they, they, they assign a certain probability to a certain base case and different probabilities to other cases. Mm-hmm. And so if your base case is that this kick that did kick the can down the road credit expansion system is at some point f- going to face some uh, blockages or some you know crossroads important crossroads if that is your base case then i think investing a certain portion of your uh, wealth into digital assets might be a good idea mm-hmm. you just have to think about what is that percentage that makes you feel okay with the drawdowns, with the volatility, with all of that. So you have to treat it as an asset class, which is the way I treat it, mm-hmm. that has some properties potentially that can play a role in these uh, crossroads the current monetary system might face at some point. But you don't know when that's going to happen because re- remember, we have talked about this monetary system. It has been there since 1971, since the gold standard was abolished, mm-hmm. since the 80s it has accelerated uh, in terms of, you know, speed of credit creation and real interest rates being lower and lower. But, you know, I could have made the same arguments 10 years ago and sound very credible as I'm sounding, sounding now that this system, you know, is running, you know, short of fuel. It, it's still running 12 years later. Mm-hmm. And of course, if you invested in certain assets, you made more money, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it deserves, digital assets deserve a role in a portfolio because when you reassess a different monetary system, you, you are at crossroads with the current one of credit creation backed by, well, nothing. Um, and, and then at some point you think, okay, maybe we need a different system to allocate resources differently, differently across people. Digital assets might play a role, especially if you think of the fact that we are becoming a more digitalized economy. We are becoming a more technologically advanced economy. Mm -hmm. And so that ecosystem will obviously not disappear. It won't go to zero. I mean, just give me a break. It exists for a reason. It it solves certain problems, and it might even have some properties in this scenario we're talking about. Therefore, I think considering it as, as an asset class, which is investable and deserves a place in your portfolio, is a very sound thing to do. On the other hand, assigning 100% probability to one outcome, like there is going to be a Bitcoin standard, it's the only way to go, or uh, this is a Tulip Bulb Mania 2.0, mm-hmm. uh, it's worth zero. And blah, I think this is not the right take. The right take is a balanced approach treat it as a digital asset class, you might have different level of convictions about what is the probability we walk towards this crossroad? How soon are these crossroads? Mm -hmm. What is the role that digital assets are going to play? Is gold going to be the way? Is a basket of of instruments going to be the way? You will assign different probabilities to a certain base case, and then you will decide what your allocation is. That's how I look at it. I, I absolutely love that. And I agree 100%. I'm actually doing that with my own net worth. So I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I look at my net worth as a pie, like a pizza pie. Um, and every asset class is a different slice. So if I believe 30% of my net worth should be in real estate, that's a slice. 30% in equities, that's a slice. You know, 5% in bonds, that's a slice. And each one of those slices, yes, they may have the probability of hypothetically going to zero, but you need to be comfortable with that, right? Yes. So if, if Bitcoin goes to zero, I'm comfortable with a certain percentage of my net worth that's in Bitcoin going to zero. So I think that's uh, my mantra on this channel is the golden middle. You know, I'm not trying to go to the moon. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, hoard cash in in the walls of my house. I'm trying to be somewhere in the middle and diversified. So with all this being said, thank you so much, uh, Alfonso Elf. I I really appreciate your time. If you can end the podcast with any nugget of wisdom, it could be any book you've read, anything you've done in the past. You know, what would you leave my audience with? I would say two things. The first is... Uh, to be a successful investor, you have to admit you will be wrong. And that is something that most people find hard to do, even professional money managers. Mm -hmm. They want to feel they have to be right 100% of the times, and that's not how it works. We all are wrong. And the most important thing is to make sure that the losses are smaller than the profits at the end of the year. Really, that's the most important. There will be losses and you can't do anything about the fact that there will be. 
but you can limit the extent of the wrong decisions and make sure the right decisions instead are uh, making large amount of profits for you. That's in general a suggestion, both as a trader, as an investor in general. Just be honest to yourself and be humble or markets will humble you. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is a sentence I'm going to borrow from my friend, uh, Michael Gayed from the Lead Lag Report. Um, and he says, there are no gurus, there are only cycles. And I quoted him in my last newsletter, and I think he's perfectly right. Because plenty of people have a narrative um, to sell, basically. And they will go around and say the same narrative for 10 years. And then like a broken clock, they will be right two times a day. Even a broken clock is right two times a day, right? It's broken, but there will be two times where it's midnight or 12 o'clock. And mm -hmm. so the, the broken clock will be right. The thing is, I learned them being nimble and honest to yourself in terms of when did you make a mistake and why. It's by far the most uh, sustainable path towards being a decent investor over the, over the long term. 100%. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I actually have that there are no gurus, there are only cycles quote, um, based on your article, um, has your portfolio realized that the money printer is out of order, but maybe we'll save that for another episode, because I know you have sure. to run. Um, where can people find you? Where can they learn more about you, Elf? So uh, the easiest way is to go and subscribe to my newsletter. It's free. So there is no, no charge at all. I publish once a week, give you macro insights, financial education, if I can, and some investment ideas as well. It's called the Macro Compass. So if you can Google it, you will find it, the Macro Compass. Otherwise, the, the link is the macrocompass.substack.com. It's a Substack free newsletter. Otherwise, you can uh, just follow me on Twitter at MacroAlf. It's a very active uh, Twitter account. It's a full-time job by now. I didn't know that running a Twitter account was so uh, difficult, but it's, it is. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I don't focus 100% of my brain on twitter because it's too much sometimes i just use it for uh, shit posting for lack of a better term <laughs> i use it for fun but guys please follow uh elf i found him on twitter and his insights as you can see from this interview are extremely deep and uh i tend to agree with a lot of what he said today i'm glad to have him on thank you so much for coming on elf i appreciate it thank you marco yep my thank pleasure Thank you for listening to the Whiteboard Finance Show. To read more about today's episode, visit whiteboardfinance.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Whiteboard Finance on YouTube. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. While it is possible to minimize your risk, your investments are solely your responsibility. This show is copyrighted by Zlatic Media LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or broadcasting. <laughs>